All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so as Julie said, we've been looking at um, different answers to the question, what is God, over the last month, just about. Um, and we looked at some selections from Abraham Joshua Heschel, and then from Mordechai Kaplan, and then from Harold Kushner. Uh, this week, we'll be looking at two uh, selections from Judith Plaskow. Um, what all of our thinkers have in common is that they all um, did the bulk of their um, writing and work in the 20th century, um, although um, Kushner and Plaskow um, are still with us in the 21st century. Um, and um, all take a contemporary approach to thinking about what God is and provide um, different um, ideas about how we might want to think about God in this day and age. Um, we're going to look at two texts from Judith Plaskow, um, and uh, just want to see if that's, yes, Julie has added to the chat um, a link to a Google file. You can um, click on that Google file and have a split screen if you want. If you're near your printer, you can print the document. Um, I will also be uh, screen sharing a little bit and putting the document on the screen for people to um, read along. Um, I would say if you've been with us um, for a couple of weeks, this week's passages are longer, um, so the font is smaller. Um, so if you have a hard copy, it might be easier, but we'll also read them um, aloud as well. Um, to, there are things that Plaskow has in common um, with the other thinkers that we've looked at in that all of the thinkers that we've looked at have um, questions about traditional theologies, ways in which Jews for thousands of years thought about God, and uh, all of them posed new models uh, for the contemporary times. Uh, what's unique about Plaskow of our set of thinkers uh, is that she's in the category of um, Jewish feminist theologians. Um, there are ways in which I think each of the other thinkers we looked at uh, were feminists in their own way, but specifically Plaskow as a theologian is a Jewish feminist theologian. We're going to look at two, passage, two, two passages today um, from her work. Um, the first comes from an article that was published in Tikkun magazine called Standing Again at Sinai, Jewish Memory from a Feminist Perspective. Um, and the second uh, comes from her book, It's Standing Again at Sinai, Judaism from a Feminist Perspective. Um, there's a connection. You, the names resonate one for another because the, um, um, th there are ways in which, you know, the article was um, the basis of some of the chapters of her book. Uh, I just find the, the text of the article, which is a little more concise than the book, was a good place to start with some of the things that she lays out. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the first text where um, Plasco makes the, uh, the argument um, for why we need a Jewish feminist theology um, that's rooted in her own experience of uh, Judaism, uh, Jewish texts, and in fact, Jewish ritual. Um, we'll take a look at that text. Text. We'll pause a little bit to talk about it, to take some questions um, to the extent that we can as a big group on Zoom. Um, and then we'll look at the second passage, which um, is the beginning of her formulation of where she thinks uh, Jewish theology from a feminist angle should go. And uh, all that being said, let's jump in. Uh, so I am going to share my screen right now. Give me a second, start broadcast. I'm getting the countdown, three, two, one. All right, my screen should be sharing and I am pulling up a text. All right, Julie, can you confirm just for me that everybody sees it or you see it? Good. Okay, terrific. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna take you through this one. We've had, people have been great. Um, oh, people have been really good at reading other weeks. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to burden anybody with this lengthy, par um, lengthy passage. Uh, these uh, quotes come from uh, the first 
uh, page of this article in Tikkun Magazine. You can see the reference at the bottom of the page. I believe you can find this online. Um, Plaska says the following. Uh, there's perhaps no verse in the Torah more disturbing to the feminist than Moses' warning to his people in Exodus 19.15. Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. From here, at the very moment that the Jewish people stand at Mount Sinai ready to enter the covenant, not now the covenant with the individual patriarchs, but presumably with the people as a whole, Moses addresses the community only as men. Moses does not say men and women do not go near each other. At the central moment of Jewish history, women are invisible. It was not their experience that interested the chronicler or that informed and shaped the text. This verse sets forth a pattern recapitulated again and again in Jewish sources. Women's invisibility at the moment of entry into the covenant is reflected in the content of the covenant, which in both grammar and substance, addresses the community as male heads of household. It is perpetuated by later tradition, which in its comments and codifications takes women as objects of concern or legislation, but rarely sees them as shapers of tradition and actors in their own lives. If Moses' words shock and anger, it is because women have always known or assumed our presence at Sinai. The passage is painful because it seems to deny what we have always taken for granted. On the one hand, of course, we were there. On the other, how is it then that the text could imply that we were not there? So Plaskow here roots um, her thought in the reading of this verse from Exodus 19.15, which comes right before the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, when uh, God and Moses are concerned that people be pure in a state of ritual purity um, to receive the Torah. And they're asked to refrain from intimate sexual relations with their spouses. But as she points out, uh, the community is not addressed saying men and women don't go near each other. Uh, the text of the Torah focuses on men. And that starts for Plaskow, the realization that our texts um, think of men um, as the central figures and actors, male heads of households, and that that assumption, which starts in the Bible, continues um, through the rabbinic endeavor and beyond. And that leads her to the question that she's asking at the end as a, as a modern feminist. Uh, this is striking to her as she realized this, as she noticed this in the Bible for the first time, because she and her peers always assumed they were part of the people who stood at Mount Sinai with everybody else on equal grounds. Um, so it's shocking on one hand to discover the text isn't framed that way. And because of that assumption, um, it seems hard that the text implies there's something off about that assumption. All right, I'm jumping back to you right now. I'm stopping the broadcast. So that's, um, that's a lot to swallow. Um, Want to pause, see if people have some questions or comments or responses to those paragraphs. Uh, you can uh, raise your hand through the raise your hand function. And uh, um, Julie will call on you. You can unmute yourself. Or you can um, send a question in the text. Let's see, what do you think about um, these opening words from Plasco? All right. I gave the pause for people to think and reflect. It's always hard to know is the quiet um, because um, processing new ideas or is the quiet because, oh yeah, of We've course. We've got a couple comments now. Oh, here they come. All right. Come. It takes people time to process. There's a lot here. It's hard no. to do Plaskow in just 45 minutes. Go ahead, Julie. 
Wendy says, I agree that the women appear invisible, but their role was different. That is their role then, I assume, at, you know, at the time of the giving of the Torah. Um, and Carrie says, I'll just read the second one, and then you can address both of them. Carrie says, we must keep in mind that we are projecting 21st century Moors onto a late Bronze Age document. So similar comment. And there are more questions, but if you wanted to. Ah, gotcha. It is true. The... Um... Torah is a product of a different era. Um, so um, we can't always, you could argue, expect that the values of today uh, would appear in that document, right? It's true, um, feminism did not emerge till re relatively recently in human history and in Jewish history as well. Um, so it, this might not be surprising or shocking that the Torah takes that view um, and, you know, by contextualizing these documents and putting them in, them in their time, um, it does help us preserve them and keep them with us today. Um, I would say Plaskow's critique and the feminist critique says that might be all well and good, but um, what that means is Judaism in its formative stage and through the centuries is a Judaism that reflects the male experience, which is only some of the experience. Um, and right, Julie said that was embedded in some of the question. Women had different roles at that time. One of the things Plaskow is interested in is to the extent that we can um, give voice to those experiences of women that happened as well. And let me pause and see if there are other things that came in. Um, So I have a comment here that says, could it mean perhaps that the men had to be instructed while women were no, knew better? Uh, that's, a, that's sometimes a response to this as well, right? Why did men need a, right? And actually there's a, it, there's an approach to Judaism in that way, right? In a traditional Jewish setting, which is not how, uh, I don't always know that's the, that's the best word because uh, we are, in lots of ways, we all live traditional Jewish lives just differently. But there are Jewish settings, especially that are heavy in observance, um, where um, the framework is that men are obligated to, to more of the commandments than women. And some of the explanation for the spirituality behind that is that um, women are spiritual in and of themselves and don't need the same rituals to tap into that spirituality that men do. Um, I would say Plaskow's response to that or... Uh, I'll say this, my response to that would be to say, uh, not, it, that might be true if it was women who were part of the de decision-making um, system that led to the creation of that, um, which now in, in our age where we have uh, men and women uh, far more co-equally involved in uh, Jewish communal leadership and uh, Jewish decision-making, uh, we'll see over the centuries how that affects changes moving forward. Uh, All right. Julie, do you have other comments to add or should we go back to the text? Can I say something? Please. Uh, I believe I, this is Eunice Kaplan. Hi, I Eunice. Believe, I, hello. I believe that the women were behind the men and the men couldn't do what they were doing in those days if the women were not supporting them because the women were taking care of the children and the household and everything else. And they gave the men the opportunity to daven and to pray and to study. Uh, right, there were different, that's an important point, right? In different ages, there were different gender roles and the contributions of women to culture, society, family were certainly significant. Um, and it did create space for men to pursue different things, right? And we know today, some of the challenges we face today where gender roles in lots of settings are, are uh, uh, blurred, um, um, it, it cr can create challenges in, um, in households. Right? I know, uh, and then, you know, two career households, sometimes that's a challenge because you don't have enough time for the family. Uh, you got to find all those balances. So thank you for that, Eunice. Oh, Julie, I see you talking, but I think you're on mute. There's a couple more comments. Um, Someone comments that there, Nola says that she's saddened to have not noticed that specification as exclusionary, but um, now she, her feelings reflect what's written by the author. Um, Sarah says, 
the Jews did not receive the Torah at that time since the sin of the golden calf. They had to redo their purity so maybe women could still be there maybe in the second time. Um, and another comment, I'm not sure who this is, but um, wouldn't it be a danger to the community? Oh, sorry, this is from Mary. Wouldn't it be a danger to the community to have more than one half of the population not included in the covenant? Say that one more time. Wouldn't it be... I want to make sure I follow. dangerous to the community to have half of the entire community not included in the covenant. Ah, that's some of the piece, right? I'm not sure if the first comment there was saying that the, the person who wrote the comment was saddened by noticing this verse or Plaskow was saddened, but I know for sure Plaskow is saddened. Um, and, you know, she writes more about this than just in these, verse, in, in these paragraphs that we saw. One of the things that strikes her about these verses is that not only... Um, it, it's not just that she discovered this in the Torah and it saddened her, but these verses we read uh, regularly as part of the regular um, uh, Parshat Shavua, the weekly Torah reading cycle. We also read them on Shavuot, the holiday on which we talk about the receiving of the Torah. Um, these are the verses that we read in synagogue and it keeps alive, says Plaskow. Um, the absence that the text marks, um, which makes her sad because she feels there's a, right, we are deficient because we don't have represented all the different voices. Um, Steve, I see you have your, uh, you signaled, uh, your hand is raised. You want to unmute yourself and uh, weigh in? Uh, yeah, I know elsewhere in that same section, it refers to the phrase, all of the people. The covenant was made with all the people. This uh, bit about abstinence is addressed towards men, but that doesn't mean that the women and children and you know the old, the young, everyone wasn't there or were excluded from the covenant. This is uh, just part of the whole thing. Uh, so Steve is suggesting if you take a wider look at the text, right, there is more inclusive language in other parts, right? And I guess part of the way um, your take on this will depend on if, you know, you, how you balance those different parts. Um, and what Steve is saying is suggesting that the covenant is meant to be all-inclusive, all of us. Um, and what Plaska was saying here is that um, actually, this verse highlights something that we would miss otherwise, which is those other verses that look all-inclusive are actually not as all-inclusive as they say, uh, or as they seem to be. Uh, so you can accept that argument um, or not accept that argument, right? I'm not here to, I'm here to represent Plaska's voice, you know, because today, but not necessarily say that, um, you know, she's going to be the thinker that guides you moving on. Uh, but her argument and the argument of the uh, of Jewish feminist theologians it does try to highlight the ways in which um, our texts are um, androcentric, meaning male-centered, and while there are voices that are, are left out. Um, so I have a comment here from Dvorah who says, how do we make a bridge to the old text uh, where it isn't pushed away altogether? And also, being new to conservative after many years of being taken from it, how do we learn the text without being resentful that there are no women's voices to make, and, um, to make part of new Jewish laws? Uh, so we'll come back to that as some as of what, um, um, when we see the next section of what Plaskow has to say. But I think you're raising a very important question, which is, um, with a feminist lens, if you look at the Torah and if you look at the rabbinic writings that come after that, um, you can be very disturbed by what you see there. Um, not every passage, um, not every place, um, but some places in particular. Um, and it can be um, painful sometimes to read those texts. Um, I could say this as a, as a person who is a student in rabbinical school during an age where uh, the students all went through school at a time where men and women sat next to each other in classes. Um, many of our professors who were rabbis ordained by the same institution and, and a generation older 
came from a time where um, that was not the case and was only men in school. Um, and something that was very much a conversation of the day um, when I was in rabbinical school is, is exactly this question. How do we look at texts that we've treasured as a people for many generations when now different people are sitting in different seats at the table and it's uncovered that some parts of the text are painful and there are things in them that seem um, not right. Um, and that's a motivating question also for Plaskow in terms of thinking about what's next, which we'll come to um, in a moment. Other questions or comments before we move to the next text? Okay, I'm doing a, to make my pedagogy train. In, when you're teaching in a classroom, they say, pause five seconds after you ask a question to give everyone a chance to think. Don't just call on the first person who raises their hand. I've discovered on Zoom, you need a 10 second pause, which is both a little more awkward because we're all, it, it, you know, if you're looking at me, I'm just sitting here for 10 seconds, <laughs> but I'm looking at the whole bunch of you and want to make sure you have time to think that through. So. Uh, there's good pedagogical ground for that pause to give us time to think. Um, all right, I'm gonna go back to um, the next selection, which gives a, uh, the start of Plaskow's What's, what's Next. Um, I will say at this point uh, in transition, um, the same thing I've said in previous weeks, it's hard to reduce any of these thinkers, Plaskow included, to a 45 minute session. Um, we're looking at two brief sets of passages. There's a lot more there, and so we're, we're moving through this fast. I hope um, that it does it justice. And uh, as we jump to the what's next, we start to see some of the fullness of her answer. Uh, um, and, uh, and you get a sense of where she's headed. Uh, all right, I am sharing my screen and coming to this new document. All right, here is section two. So um, this goes to the, what's next for Plaskow in terms of Jewish theology? Um, I would say in her book, Standing Again at Sinai, Judaism from a feminist perspective, she has chapters that talk about text and about ritual um, and about Israel and about Torah and about sexuality and about repairing the world. Um, the section that we're looking at here is particularly her section about theology. Um, where we wanted, because uh, that's where she addressed the issue of um, um, what is God. Uh, so I am interested, says Plasco, in exploring and transforming the metaphors for God that have been formed in the Jewish imagination and shaped Jewish self-understanding and behavior. So I want to look at that. She's interested in exploring and transforming, two important verbs there, the metaphors for God. Continuing the next paragraph, the representation of God as male, for example, is comprehensible only in the context of an androcentric Torah that is elaborated and rendered plausible by a male defined community. And I pause, this is Elliot speaking now. That's some of what some of your comments said before, right? In its time where there were certain gender roles and uh, society was as it was, it makes sense um, in that world to have male um, images of God represented in the Torah um, when the community was male defined, at least you know, through the biblical text. Uh, continuing with Plaska, well, this does not mean that the Jewish concept of God is simply the projection of a male dominated society. It does mean that the experience of God is sustained and interpreted in the categories of a patriarchal culture. So we've inherited a lot, this is Elliot speaking again, not Plaska. We've inherited a lot, she says, um, from times when society looked different from it did today. And those, the images that we inherited from that society, which was male dominated, have certain images and projections of God that become central to Judaism. And they are, she says, part of what Judaism is, but also notes that they don't make up the full potential vision of what those are. Back to the text. As I see it, says Plaskow, the goal of a Jewish feminist approach to God language is to incorporate women's God wrestling into the fullness of Torah 
by finding images that can communicate and evoke the experience and the presence of God in a diverse, egalitarian, and empowered community of Israel. That looks at, going back to her first paragraph, uh, the transforming piece. She would like to uh, see us, um, and uh, she, this she was writing in the 90s. I would, I would hope um, that if she were with us today, she would say we've made some good progress on steps of this. Um, to look and incorporate into our tradition God language, metaphors for God that incorporate women's struggles with God and the fullness of Torah by, by uh, representing the full range of human experience with God, not just those inherited in our text that represent the um, male images, but we give voice to those who didn't have full voice, or even if they had voice in, in their day, that their voices weren't preserved in the text. Um, and we try to find ways to give voice to the rise to those voices uh, today. Um, right on. I think I'm back. You're back. Okay. I got a different screen. That's a sense of where um, is she, where she's headed. Um, thoughts, responses, comments about that. Uh, Dvorah says in the chat, how do we do that? Um, how do we do that in reality? Ah, what's the topless of it? What are steps? Um, oh, I'm already seeing a response to that, someone says. Um, I think Debbie Friedman's music reflects similar thoughts. Um, yeah, I, I, I believe Debbie Friedman and Judith Plaskow um, knew each other. I don't know how close they were. Um, but that is true. If you know Debbie Friedman's music, Debbie Friedman was a 20th century Jewish musician. Um, uh, she wrote a lot of music that is sung um, in Jewish camps in, in lots of synagogues. Um, she is a product of the reform movement. So uh, uh, the reform movement sings much more of hers than other places. But uh, one of the things that Debbie Friedman tried to do is incorporate male and female God image, God images and uh, male and female versions of prayers uh, you know hebrew is a gendered language so when she wrote in hebrew she sometimes used the traditional male language of the siddur and sometimes took a prayer that's in the prayer book and put it in its feminine form and put that to music um, so that's one answer to the question how do we do this practically um, we can build and create new rituals that bring the female voice in um, in um, some through music. Um, you know, we talked about um, two weeks ago when we talked about Mordechai Kaplan, one of the facts as I was giving his bio a little bit to know about Mordechai Kaplan was that uh, in the early 20th century, his daughter, Judith, was the, uh, Judith Kaplan, not Judith, uh, was the first um, girl to have a bat mitzvah um, in the North American scene. And, um, you know, over the course of the 20th century, um, in Jewish settings, women's access to um, Torah and the ability to learn and study and women's access to perform and public rituals has uh, grown and reshaped the Jewish landscape. So that's another way um, that Plasco would say we can do that. Um, she talks about um, trying to uncover um, uh, female voices in our text and bring them to light. Uh, some that times that's by studying things that aren't that are in the tradition that aren't studied as often as other texts. And sometimes it's about studying our texts and writing new midrashim about them. Um, we have a lot of writers, right? You see that in the, the fiction world today. If you read um, uh, the Red Tent or um, uh, Aviva Diamond, the Red Tent. In some ways, that's a modern midrash that gives different voices, right? And there are some. Uh, female perspectives there that are different from this. You're right. It's a retelling of uh, some of Genesis. I see my text, my uh, 
my text is going on. Uh, oh, it was Julie just writing Viva Diamond, the Red Tent. <laughs> Thank you. There's a resource. There, right are, there were a few other questions that I, I Okay, sent. great. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I'll read them. Um, I, so Nancy mentions that there are some non-male names for God in Hebrew, um, including Makom, Rahmana, and Ruach. Um, Wendy asks, what about all of us being created in the image of God? And Sarah asks, does the Torah only use the male pronoun when describing God? Uh, so the Torah predominantly uses male pronouns, although not exclusively. There are um, female images in the Bible for God. Um, actually, that's some of, you know, about how we look at our text, right? Uh, someone said, what about right, being created in the image of God? Um, the, the feminist biblical um, scholars um, have gone back to foundational stories uh, in Genesis and other places to try to read them more closely. Um, and there's a wonderful reading of, of Genesis where it says, right, God created, God created people in God's image, male and female, God created them. Uh, that's a rough translation because I don't have that text right in front of me, but the um, yeah, there's a very powerful egalitarian read of that that says, right, God created people in God's image, and we can reflect since people come in both male and female, uh, God must also encompass both male and female. Um, and it's a feminist reading of that passage from Genesis that gives um, legitimacy to looking more for those female images which are present in the Bible, but are certainly overshadowed in terms of number uh, by the male images that are there. Other thoughts, questions, mentions, or comments? Um, someone mentions also the term shechina, um, uh, yeah. and the, the mishkan being feminine. And where in the passage and what book did you say it was in? I'm not sure. Deborah, uh, which... That was about um, God being, people being created in God image, male and female. Um, I want to say that's in Genesis 1. Yeah. Um, Genesis 1. And I believe... Um, I did talk before some... Uh, someone wants to come. I believe uh, if you're interested in that, the, there's a book, you can, the um, feminist, I think it's called Feminist Reading of Genesis, um, has some scholarly articles looking at the book of Genesis to try to um, unpack um, some stories we read a lot and look at them through different lenses. Uh, yeah. Anyways, someone, um, I heard someone's uh, voice there who wanted to jump in. They must have been, you remuted yourself. Oh, Rosa says Gen Genesis 127. Yep, that's about right. You looked it up, I think. <laughs> um, yes, I'm getting the nod from Rosa. 127, I will go with that. Uh, okay. Um, all right. So here's what I'd love to, uh, a few comments for the last few minutes. Um, I hope you'll all feel a part of them, but partially directed to those who have been with us for the last four weeks or, or a number of the last four weeks. Um, we all come to encounter God in part, sometimes in our own life and experience, um, and in part, sometimes uh, in synagogue and school, through the prayer book, through the Bible. Some of the images that we inherit work very well for us, and some don't. Um, one of the reasons why I think the 20th century was a very productive time theologically for Jews um, uh, was in part um, because uh, for the second half of the 20th century, uh, especially in the West, Jews live very comfortably. Um, and I think at times of comfort, you have more time to think about theology. Uh, but in part, uh, our mid-century experience, um, especially uh, especially in Europe, was that of the Holocaust. Um, and I think 
for the Jewish people as a whole, the Holocaust um, shattered many people's theologies. Um, for many centuries, Jews living in exile felt that they were there waiting for redemption to return to Israel, and they would do so when we had merited it or when God was ready to bring us back. But I think there was always underlying that, that no matter how bad it was in diaspora, God made sure there was a line that was never crossed into how much Jews would have to suffer. I think for many people, the Holocaust crossed that line. And it meant many of the beliefs about God and the theologies that existed um, pre-World War II that were alive and well, some of them for centuries, didn't work the same way afterwards. Uh, and so thinkers, uh, new thinkers came to the floor. Um, and if you know, um, you know, if you remember, right, Mordechai Kaplan started writing in the early 20th century. So his thinking wasn't a response to the Holocaust. But I think the embrace of his thinking was in part was. In part was. Um, I think um, live, living today, we're still in a post-Holocaust world, uh, although the, our um, immediate memory is fading as um, there are fewer and fewer survivors still with us. Um, but I do think we live in an age where people are questioning belief systems that come from uh, centuries past in whatever religious faith they're growing up in. And we're looking for new ways to think about God that fit the world in which we live in. Mordechai Kaplan, Abraham Joshua Heschel, uh, Harold Kushner and Judith Blaskow are just four of many 20th century writers um, who gave new voices uh, to the theological conversation, who gave new perspectives and paradigms for thinking about God. Um, we could add to that list Martin Buber, um, Chaim Salvechik, um, Neil Gilman, Eugene Borowitz. The list goes on and on and on. Um, there are many, 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 many people we could think to write about. Um, we looked at four in particular in this course. And I, what I hope was you got a taste if these thinkers were new. I know from some of your questions and comments along the way, some of you are already familiar with the thinkers that we were looking at. Um, but I hope for those of you who are encountering these thinkers for the first time, you got some new ideas, uh, new potential directions that you can uh, use to put in uh, on your shelf uh, you know, for your reading into your own personal theology. Um, I think um, thinking about belief for Jews is very important in this day and age. Um, Jewish culture is alive and well um, and very rich. We've had an explosion of culture at the end of the 20th century into the 21st century. Um, Jewish ritual is... Um, developing because of that and alive and well in different ways in different communities. But I think Jewish belief um, is sometimes put on the back bench. Um, and I myself think uh, uh, being thoughtful and careful about um, our own beliefs, spending time cultivating and nurturing them is very important. And I hope uh, over the last four weeks in uh, skimming the surface of four different thinkers, uh, you have some new things to think about. And it's uh, giving you next steps on your own Jewish journeys. And I imagine given the number of people on this uh, Zoom session, um, we're all in very different places in those journeys. But I hope that um, these thinkers and potentially others can be uh, new partners for you to engage in Jewish thought um, and develop even more your own uh, theologies and that they'll serve you well through good times and bad um, at... Uh, times of quarantine and hopefully soon um, at times when we can return to um, what we had been calling what we now call the normal of before um, we'll see what that looks like moving forward um, i want to thank everybody who's joined us these weeks it's been a great pleasure for me to be able to take some time out of my monday afternoons this month to uh, reflect on these theologians and i hope uh, that um you've gotten um uh, out of it at least as much as I have uh, in the process and that um, um, you'll find more opportunities through my Jewish learning and other places to nurture uh, your Jewish souls uh, as we're stuck in our houses and even beyond. That. So thanks. Thank you so much. This was such a fantastic class. Um, it was great to see 
so many different thinkers. Um, are there any are there any more thinkers you would throw out for people to explore on their own if they wanted to continue? Uh, sure. Uh, I, I would say the place if this is a newer world to you, uh, the book I would recommend first is um, uh, Neil Gilman's Sacred Fragments. Um, Neil Gilman was uh, he was my teacher. He was um, a student of Heschel and Kaplan's. Uh, I think a contemporary of, of Kushner's um, and uh, he, he taught all their works. He taught Plaskow also as well. Um, one of the things I like about Sacred Fragments is Gilman lays out, um, an, uh, I think a sociological and anthropological description of faith and belief that works in our day um, and takes you through the thoughts of different thinkers. In some ways, it's, a, it's an introduction to modern Jewish thought. Um, and if you're thinking about thinking about your own theology, it's a good guide to help you um, do that. Um, to look at the thinkers that we thought about with Heschel, I would start with um, God in Search of Man or Man is Not Alone. Um, the Kushner book that we looked at the excerpts from is uh, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Um, Kaplan, I, if you really want to sink your teeth into Kaplan, Judaism as Civilization is his major opus. He got better at explaining what he believed later. So um, uh, the future of the American Jew, um, I think, is a good place to start with Kaplan. Uh, Plaskow's book is Standing Again at Sinai. Um, Soloveitchik is another thinker. Um, I would read first um, Lonely Man of Faith. Um, Soloveitchik, of everybody I've mentioned, he um, comes from an Orthodox perspective but a, and a very compelling modern theology. Um, worth reading. Um, Martin Buber, a lot of people will say read I and Thou. It's a wonderful book. It's very hard, uh, but a good one to look at. Um, I, I got a thank you text and a New York Times. Anyway, sorry, politics came in as I got a New York Times update. Sorry, I will, was going to read it, but I'll leave that to different. <laughs> no politics for this class. Um, Eugene Borowitz, Renewing the Covenant, is another piece you might want to look at. Uh, Eugene Borowitz was the um, Dean of Theology. That, that wasn't his official title. Uh, he was a professor at Hebrew Union College for a lifetime, and uh, Renewing the Covenant is a major work. Uh, if you're looking for something more from Kabbalah, the sort of the spiritual side of things, uh, Arthur Green's, Art Green's um, um, Seek, Speak My Name, oh, Seek My Face, Speak My Name. Is that oh, what? Yeah. Uh, that's close. Um, Uh, ooh, Sarah says, any orthodox feminists to read? Um, uh, yes. Hang on, let me see if I am meant to leave right next door my folder. Uh, oh, yes, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, hang on. Um, there are... Uh, no, I don't have that listed here. Um, there are definitely Orthodox Jewish feminists. There's been a lot of um, interesting developments in the Orthodox world, um, especially on the ground, on the practical sense, with the emergence of um, um, women taking on pastoral functions in synagogues um, and um, the ordination of women in Orthodox settings. Um, don't have at the tip of my tongue or my fingertips suggestions. Um, but I would imagine Rabbi Google would be a good help. And I would imagine my Jewish learning might be a place to start for some sources for that. Oh, yes. Thank you, Julie. Jofa is a good word source. The Jewish Orthodox Feminist Association. Is that the A? They're a great place.